something that we've been working on for about five or six years. And it has to do with the idea that there's a direct cardiac damage during severe pneumonia episodes. Uh, the bacteria that we work with in my laboratory is Streptococcus pneumonia. Uh, pertinent to our conversation today, uh, you need to know it's a gram-positive bacteria. It has two virulence determinants that are principal for today's talk. One is a pore-forming toxin called pneumolysin, and this uh, binds to cholesterol on the cell membrane, and it punches a hole that allows calcium to uh, enter the cell, ion dysregulation. And it also produces hydrogen peroxide. It does so in profuse amounts, and this, it does so at cytotoxic levels. And this is just simply part of its metabolism. This bacteria is the leading cause of community-acquired pneumonia, and as a result of that, is also the leading cause of bacteremia and sepsis. So it makes it the number one infectious cause of death in older adults. That last part is pertinent because, actually, uh, pneumonia is frequently associated with adverse cardiac events. You may or may not be aware of this. This is a meta-analysis by Corrales, Vicente Corrales Medina in 2011, where he uh, looked around, I think it was 12 studies, that looked at the incidence of heart failure or associated complications during uh, diagnosis of pneumonia. One of the first things that became very evident was that if you developed pneumonia, went to see your doctor, were given antimicrobials, and were sent home just to relax, that you really had nothing at all to worry about. The incidence of pneumonia, of adverse cardiac events in these, in these individuals were very low, almost nothing. On the other hand, if you had a more severe form of pneumonia that the doctor felt you needed to be hospitalized, all of a sudden you were, in, you were sort of in trouble. And the incidence of inpatients, adverse cardiac events in inpatients, can you guys see the arrow? I'm not sure. You guys can't see what I'm pointing at. Well, okay. In the, in the second row, on inpatients, uh, is anywhere from 10 to 20%. If we stratify this even further, looking at those that are in the ICU, so these are individuals now who have developed bacteremia, have developed sepsis, are experiencing acute respiratory stress syndrome, the incidence of acute and adverse cardiac event are anywhere from 10 to 30 percent. That is a sizable population. In 2007, Dan Lusher at the VA in Houston actually did this specifically looking at pneumococcal pneumonia. And he determined that of 170 patients admitted to the VA over a three-year period with confirmed pneumococcal disease, that about 20% of them had some form of adverse cardiac event. Most often, it was congestive heart failure, but it was associated with arrhythmias and myocardial infarction. One of the most important observations that he made was that individuals that experienced adverse cardiac events while they had pneumonia, they were four times more likely to die as a result. In fact, the mortality in pneumonia individuals experiencing pneumonia was driven by a large part by these adverse cardiac events. This is not an acute disease problem. If we look at the incidence of adverse cardiac events after you, pneumonia has been resolved, so after successful treatment with antimicrobials and release of these individuals from the hospital, you can see on the left that the incidence of adverse, the adjusted hazard ratio for an adverse cardiac event is anywhere from five to 10, uh, one to three months after the pneumonia episode. And it declines a little bit over years, but as far as five years after the pneumonia episode, there's still a two-fold increase in the risk. If we look at individuals at time of admission and we look at their cardiac troponin levels and we stratify these based on the highest tertial, middle tertial, and lowest tertial, those with the highest level of cardiac troponin in serum, which we all know is a marker of heart damage, at time of admission, less than 30% were likely to be alive four years later. And these individuals, in other studies, are primarily found to die of adverse cardiac events. Finally, there's a recent study by Urich, and they looked at what were the risk factors, what are the driving risk factors that are associated with adverse cardiac events during a pneumonia episode. So what during pneumonia leads to adverse cardiac events later? And the number one finding that stood out, as you can see in the second row from the bottom, is pneumococcal bacteremia. So if you had severe pneumonia that led to bacteremia, you had a 2.4-fold increased chance of having an adverse cardiac event later on. And this actually is for 10 years out. So in our laboratory, we think that we've sort of maybe figured out the reason for this. 
and that's this. That the bacteria is able to enter the myocardium. It actually crosses the vascular endothelial cell, enters the heart muscle, and it replicates and it kills cardiomyocytes. On the left, I have a picture of a heart from a mouse with invasive pneumococcal disease. The bacteria are stained for with green with antibodies against the capsular polysaccharide. And you can clearly see that there are foci replicating bacteria in the heart muscle. On the right is an H&E. You can see that these bacteria have formed a small pocket or lesion where they're replicating. There's an absence of immune cells. And this is in the muscle. So this is not like endocarditis. It's not a vascular disease. It is inside the myocardium. If we do EKGs of these animals, I'm not going to try to decipher this. You guys know this much better than I do. But I will tell you that, as you can see, in an animal before and after disease, that the electrophysiology of that heart collapses. And these animals go on to die very soon after. If we treat these animals with antimicrobials and we save them, we see this about a week later. This is cardiac remodeling, as determined by standing with picrocerius red. And you can see the red spots seven days after infection. This is de novo collagen deposition in the heart muscle. We, these, these coincide with areas that we believe were former lesion sites. So we think this is a potential explanation for why someone who had a severe disease episode would be likely to have an adverse cardiac event even in their convalescence. And data that supports this is helped with the, the help of Ganesh Haled and our, our, my postdoc, Sarah Benno, that here that shows uh, by using echocardiograph that functional shortening, fractional shortening, sorry, and ejection fraction are diminished three months after intervention with antimicrobials. If we look at these animals, they look perfectly normal to us, but when we look at their hearts using echo, you can see that they are impaired. I want to emphasize this is not a mouse trick. We have done this using non-human primates with baboons now. We see on the left what appears to be pre-lesions, okay? Now with the baboons, we're not able to push the disease as far as we're able to do with the mouse. So in the baboon, we're forced to stop for ethical reasons. At the time of which, if this was a human, this human would be admitted to an ICU, okay? But you can see clearly that there's bacteria in the myocardium and the bacteria seem to be replicating. Humans are much more sensitive to the toxin pneumolysin and mysoc. And actually, so the extent of cardiac injury, as you can see in the top left, or on the right side, but on the left panel, you can see that the cardiac damage, the myopathy, is considerable in these, in these animals. And you can see if we rescue these baboons with antimicrobials, that again, there is considerable cardiac remodeling, and this potentially explains adverse cardiac events again. We do have anecdotal data that this occurs in humans. But it has actually been difficult to get deceased samples from confirmed individuals who had confirmed pneumococcal pneumonia. <coughs> so how does this develop? This is what we've been studying in our lab. And we know that the bacteria enters the heart individually during bacteremia. So in the small square, in the small fragment to the left, you can actually see an individual bacteria inside the myocardium early after the onset of bacteremia. We know that this bacteria replicates because when we take GFP, when we take a mixture of bacteria that have GFP and those that don't, and then we look at the formation of lesions, all the bacteria in each of the lesions either express GFP or they don't express GFP, indicating that there is a single entry point and that entry, and that bacteria then replicates to form a lesion. It's not multiple bacteria getting into the same site over and over again. If you look at the scanning electron microscopy images, you can see that in the heart, there's a small vacuolar uh, component that contains bacteria. This grows over time. It's associated, it's associated with red blood cells. Sir, one second. Oh, here, can you see that? I can't tell. Oh. Okay. Well, these, these clusters are next to blood vessels, suggesting that they, might, that they started off from it. And as time goes on, the bacteria replicates, the lesion gets, gets, gets bigger and bigger. <coughs> One of the things that's interesting is that initially you see what appear to be macrophages, but they disappear. And this makes it very different than a staphylococcal abscess. If you were to look at staphylococcus lesions, they're actually full of macrophages, full of neutrophils. We're not seeing this for pneumococcus. So what is actually happening with the bacteria in regards to the macrophages? 
Well, we know that the bacteria get taken up by macrophages very quickly. So uh, on the top, you see an uninfected heart where we detect macrophages. And then we have D39, which is a serotype 2 isolate that's very poor at forming cardiac microlesions, and Tiger 4, a serotype 4 isolate that's very good at forming microlesions. And you can see in both cases that the macrophages have found the bacteria, have taken it up, and you see that the bacteria are inside of the macrophages. If we look a little bit later, you can see that most of the bacteria appear to be dead. So at this mid-stage point, we have what appears to be the remnants of bacteria. So this, uh, we think these are bacteria that have been killed, and now you're just looking at little bacterial fragments dispersed throughout the cytoplasm of these macrophages. And we think that this is actually what happens most of the time. Uh, a little bit more insight as to what actually happens can be gained here, where we do uh, invasion survival assays in vitro using uh, J774 macrophages. One thing I want to point out uh, in the panel on the, the middle panel on the left is that Tiger 4, D39, and two mutants of Tiger 4, one that doesn't make pneumolysin and one that doesn't make hydrogen peroxide, that they all are taken up by macrophages at exactly the same level. We don't see any differences in uptake. So the ability to cause these lesions doesn't, isn't because they're escaping surveillance by the macrophages. In the middle panel, what you see, though, is the death of the bacteria. And if you look at the D39 line, the gray line, you see that from zero to seven hours, almost all the D39 are eradicated. In fact, less than 0.2% of these original amount of D39 bacteria are alive. The same is almost true for Tiger IV. There is a massive collapse in the amount of Tiger IV there that, that are apparent. But you can see that between five and seven hours, the number of Tiger IV that are there, it stays persistent. So there's a small percentage of cells that are bacteria that seem to be persistent, to be, seem to be survivors. If you take away pneumolysin or you take away hydrogen peroxide, these two virulence factors, that ability to persist disappears. And so from five to seven hours on, on the far right panel in the middle, the number of type of four bacteria stays constant versus the number of D39 bacteria continues to decline. In fact, we actually think that at this point, type of four is replicating inside of macrophages. And that's evidenced by the fact that we detect BRDU positive pneumococci within monocytes at these time points, whereas for D39, T4 delta pneumolysin, and delta SPXB, we don't see any BRDU suggesting that these bacteria are in fact dead. In regards to what happens to the macrophage, we see that Tiger IV is able to kill the macrophages. This is a very simple assay. We're simply looking for the number of propidium iodide positive cells. Uh, on the far left are the uninfected cells. And so if you look at the panels on the lower left corner, if you look at Tiger IV infected cells, you can see, you see just an increase in number of dying cells, the, the, the bright uh, circular cells on the surface. D39 does not do this. And if we look at pneumolysin and SPXP deficient mutants of Tiger IV, that this is not the case. So Tiger IV is able to kill macrophages versus D39 is not. And that translates to what we're seeing inside the heart. For D39, when we look at scanning electron microscopy of infected hearts, we find, D we find the bacteria, but we always find it within cardiomyocytes that are patrolling the circulation. It doesn't ever seem to get out. On the other hand, you can see that Tiger IV seems to have killed something in the vicinity of the, the capillary and is now growing and forming. So we actually suspect that these lesions begin, off, begin as macrophages that at very low frequency are unable to kill the bacteria, but then this serves as a sort of biogenesis for these lesions. So there's enough bacteria coming into the heart that even though one in every 500 bacteria is able to overcome this defense that there's still enough that it's still happening at a rate that will lead to infectious, to infectious outcome and uh, damage. So what happens to the cardiomyocytes? So these experiments are now are at low MOI. We're very interested in seeing what happens at the early stages, not when there's a, a full-blown cardiac lesion. And we know that the bacteria has to be alive if you want to see cardiomyocyte death. And in fact, the bacteria has to be able to physically contact the cardiomyocyte. If we, in the middle panel on the right-hand side, uh, if you are separate the bacteria from HL1 cardiomyocytes with a membrane, we see no cell death. Only when the bacteria are on the same side as the cells 
do the cells die? That means it is not secreted pneumolysin, it is not secreted hydrogen peroxide, but that's able to do this, but somehow it requires cell contact. If we look at intracellular, we see that cardiomyocytes, in fact, take up pneumococci. We see this by scanning electron microscopy, where we see bacteria within an endosome, but also maybe sometimes the cytoplasm. This is confirmed by fluorescent microscopy, a separate assay, and we see that the bacteria are replicating when we do BRDU staining for, for live bacteria inside. How are the bacteria getting into the cardiomyocyte? Well, we took a, an inhibitor approach to trying to search this. On the far left, we have a panel of inhibitors. MBCD inhibits uh, the formation of the clathrin pit, which is important for clathrin hypnosis. Cytoplasm D inhibits uh, acne polymerization. Genenstein is a protein kinase inhibitor. It also inhibits uh, phagocytosis. And pit stop is an inhibitor of clathrin cytosis. And in the middle upward panel, you can see that only MBCD and pit stop actually stopped bacterial uptake. So the bacteria are being taken up as a result of clathrin mediated cytosis. On the top right panel, you can see that actually cardiomyocyte death at low MI requires bacterial uptake. If you block uptake using pit stop, which blocks clathrin mediated cytosis, the cardiomyocytes stay alive. This, on the lower panel, this isn't really relevant to, to this party, but there's been a lot of work that shows how pneumococcus crosses vascular endothelial cells, and this work has been done to look at meningitis. And we know from our own work that that's the same mechanism that the bacteria crosses into the myocardium. And this is dependent on the bacterial adhesin choline binding protein A, and the host receptors, polymeric immunoglobulin, lamin receptor, and platelet activating factor receptor. None of those factors are involved in cardiomyocyte invasion. So the pneumococcus is getting in, it's getting in through clathrin cytosis, but it's not through a mechanism that's been described before for other organs or for other sites. What is the consequence of this, or what does the bacteria need to kill that cardiomyocyte? The same thing it needs for macrophages. It needs hydrogen peroxide produced by SPXP, and it needs pneumolysin. A delta pneumolysin and a delta SPXP mutant they form less microlesions in infected hearts, and they form smaller lesions with distinct different morphologies. Uh, we see a lot more immune cells in these, in, these things, in these hearts. Now, we have done quite a bit of work on pneumolysin and shown that pneumolysin is very important for these lesions. It's a bit obvious that a poor forming toxin would, would kill cardiomyocytes, and it does. So we were interested in actually pursuing the other virus term, hydrogen peroxide. So in this experiment, on the top left, we took HL1 cardiomyocytes and we infected them with pneumococcus, a low MOI. And then we treated them with catalase or with temple. Uh, catalase is an enzyme. It reduces hydrogen, breaks down hydrogen peroxide, versus, uh, cat with, whereas temple is a superoxide dismutase mimetic. And it's actually able to cross the cell membrane, whereas catalase is not. So catalase stays outside of the cell. And you can see that temple, but not catalase, protected the cardiomyocytes from death. So you have to, so this reactive oxygen species uh, that is contributing to cell death needs to be, is coming from within the, within the infected cardiomyocyte. And it's most likely the bacteria for SPXP derived. If we treat the animals with temple, we see that there's a stark reduction in the amount of cardiac lesions that are formed in cells. So this is very encouraging for us. Now there are many ways that cardiomyocytes can die. I'm sure all of you are aware of apoptosis, whether it's uh, an extrinsic or intrinsic, and that involves caspase activation. There's always there's also pyroptosis, which involves caspase one, and that is an explosive form of cell death that releases IL-1 beta because the inflammasome is activated. There's necrosis, where the cell membrane disintegrates and it releases its cytoplasmic contents. And you may or may not be aware of a form of cell death called necroptosis that looks like necrosis to the eye, but is actually programmed, and it involves the molecules RIP1, RIP3, and MLKL, and I'll talk a little bit about those in a second. One of the major distinguishing factors between necroptosis and apoptosis is necroptosis does not involve any caspases. So if we infect cardiomyocytes, 
and we treat them with inhibitors of caspase 1 for pyroptosis, or 3, 8, or 9 for extrinsic and intrinsic apoptosis, you can see that none of those prevent cell death. Therefore, we rule out that apoptosis is a meaningful cause of cell death when these cardiomyocytes are infected with pneumococcus. On the other hand, NEC5, necrostatin 5, which blocks group K1, GSK, which blocks group K3, and NSA, which blocks MLKL, all key components of the necroptosis pathway. They all each confer protection to cardiomyocytes, suggesting that it's necroptosis that's actually responsible for cardiomyocyte death. The active form of MLKL that results in membrane dissolution is phosphorylated MLKL, and we detect that within cardiac myocardial lesions inside the heart. We also infected RIPK3 knockout animals and MLKL knockout animals, and you can see that we see decreased amounts of troponin in the serum of these animals, and the number of cardiac lesions in these animals is substantially reduced. So necroptosis appears to be one of the mechanisms by which the cells are dying as a result of pneumococcal invasion. Now, the necroptosis pathway has been uh, described for at least 10 years now, and it's, it's, it's a little bit more complicated than I say, but it's up there on the left. It's still one of the more simple cell death pathways. And one of the things that we have determined over the last few years, uh, looking at airway epithelial cell death, is that ore forming toxins such as pneumolysin and reactive oxygen species such as hydrogen peroxide, that they are able to bypass the death receptor and they activate RIPK1 directly. And this leads to phosphorylation of MLKL uh, as a result of RIP1 activating RIP3, and together these activate MLKL. <coughs> Now, there was, there was a screen looking for necroptosis inhibitors performed a few years ago now uh, by Foster. I think it was in 2015. And they identified two tyrosine kinase inhibitors, panatinib and pazapinib, that are currently FDA approved to treat uh, leukemia. And these inhibit RIPK1 or RIPK1 and RIPK3 respectively. And in the paper that describes this inhibition, the authors say that if you're interested, that these two drugs might be useful for preventing necroptosis-related diseases. So we were very keen in looking to see if we could use these drugs to prevent the cardiac injury that we see in our mice. And as a matter of fact, we do. You can see that animals that are treated with 1.2 milligrams per kilogram of uh, panatinib, that they are protected, that we see less cardiac troponin being released from cardiomyocytes and we also see substantially less cardiac lesions. And we see that, uh, and, th and that's across the board. Importantly, we do not see a reduction in the number of bacteria that are actually in the heart or in the blood. This is not an antimicrobial. We are not affecting the bacterial burden. We're simply preventing the cells from dying by blocking their death. So this is potentially a powerful adjunct therapy to a normal antimicrobial therapy uh, that is probably worth investigating. Um, I want to also add that we're very keen, as, obviously, as to what happens in the airway. And necroptosis is not limited to the cardiomyocytes. It actually also happens in the airway, and it has profound consequence on the lungs. And we know that our drug also protects the airway from pneumonia as well, and that's evidenced here. So in conclusion, severe pneumonia is associated with adverse cardiac events during hospitalization and convalescence. These have a profound impact on mortality. The pneumococcus is able to invade the myocardium and cause direct cardiotoxicity. SPN is taken up by macrophages and cardiomyocytes, and these are in turn killed in a pneumolysis and hydrogen peroxide dependent manner. Cardiomyocyte death is a result of necroptosis, and necroptosis is triggered by multiple insults caused by the bacteria, including ion, ion dysregulation, reactive oxygen species produced by the bacteria, as well as mitochondrial damage that in itself triggers uh, ROS. And drugs that block necroptosis may be a viable adjunct therapy for invasive pneumococcal diseases. So this was done by a pretty good-sized group of people in two different universities. We moved here only three years ago. But uh, some of the people that uh, deserve credit include Anacol Chinoy, Norberto, Norberto Gonzalez, uh, Ryan Gilly, Ashley Wrigley, and Sarah Sarabino. And some of them presented posters yesterday, so you might have seen them. Thank you.
there any other streptococcus species that you would suspect would cause this? I mean, in the clinical side, I mean, we see streptococcus and not necessarily pneumonia, they could be from the airway. So there's, yes, absolutely. So um, the first thing is necroptosis is caused by poor forming toxins. So any bacteria that has a poor forming toxin is capable of triggering necroptosis. And we've actually shown that with staph, with group based strap, with many others. Uh, there is a paper of, the last name is on Hamdi, and it shows that circulating, circulating levels of poor forming toxins can damage the heart also. So you don't necessarily have to be in the heart, you could just be is there enough of this toxins in the circulation that that can also cause cardiac damage. The other thing is these poor forming toxins punch holes in cells, which disrupts calcium signaling, which as we know in the heart is very important. And there's profound loss of contractile strength in animals when they're infected with these types of pathogens. Hi, thank you, I really enjoyed this talk. Um, so I wanted to um, ask you about, uh, so one of the adverse events was arrhythmias. So and I was curious if you have information, is that during the infectious phase where the bacteria are alive, or is this more after the cardiac remodeling has recurred? Do you know? So we've only done very limited studies. We're, we're trying to do much more on the convalescent stage. Uh, what I can tell you... Do you know in patients already? Or in, does, is it more of an you know, event admitted <coughs> to the hospital? Or? I honestly don't know. The only, I mean, the clinical epidemiology suggests that there's some form of heart damage that's long lasting, but I can't tell you the specific details. Great question. Uh, so, you had a dog and I was by your baby school study yesterday. She did a fabulous dog in the day. I'm a decade away from microbiology. I read echoes for a living. Um, what about pneumococcal vaccine? Ah, so the key factor for all of this, and it had, ties back to the original study, to the original observation in that meta-analysis, is severity of disease. You have to have bacteremia for the bacteria to gain access to the vasculature, which allows it to gain access to the heart. So low titers wouldn't be protected. So the vaccine, which is a 13 valent, right, right now if you're taking Prevnar, will protect you against those 13 serotypes, and it's actually it's an amazing vaccine if there was only 13 serotypes. But there's 90 serotypes, and as we get older, our immune system wanes, and there's quite a bit of epidemiological data that suggests that as you get older, you're susceptible to these non-vaccine serotypes. So we're still susceptible to those. One quick question on the, uh, on the hydrogen peroxide. Yes. And, uh, in the medical school, it taught us, you know, macrophage killed bacteria with the hydrogen peroxide, with the superoxide. But uh, how does the bacteria hijack that and kill all of the cells? It doesn't kill all. So if you were paying attention to the percentage, actually only one in 500 bacteria uh, survived the macrophage. Got it. So right? So that's a very low number. But if you go back to that original picture, uh, the number of heart lesions is actually not as many. Let's say it's 20 or so. But you're talking about an animal that has bacteremia, almost sepsis. So the number of bacteria in the bloodstream is 10 to the fifth, 10 to the sixth, 10 to the seventh per mil. So it's, the bacteria almost always loses that fight. Okay. But in that rare instance where it actually wins and it's able to survive and sometimes replicate, that seems to be important because it serves as the center of a replica, now maybe even a protected niche you could think of, because it's within a dead cell. And that allows the bacteria to grow and gives an opportunity to cause, to emerge from that in a more damaging way. So the antioxidant is still a viable, oh, you know? So, so I think, yes, I think the macrophages kill the majority of the time, bacteria most of the time with, with hydroperoxide. As far as how does hydroperoxide help the bacteria, we're looking at that and we actually think that the hydroperoxide released by the bacteria actually facilitates pneumolysin damage. We think it actually oxidizes the, mem the lipid membranes, those endosomes, and then the bacteria toxin has an easier time uh, damaging them in turn. But we have, that's not published, we, we're guessing. Any other questions?